Zach is back. It's the Zach Geld Show on Fox Sports 920, The Jersey. All right, welcome back in. 415 from the Princeton Orthopedic Associates Studios, 609-919-9200 is the number if you want to hop on board with us. Eagles OTA is underway. Day one was earlier today. You heard from Doug Peterson this morning. You heard from Carson Wentz in the afternoon and someone that always does a great job with this coverage of the Philadelphia Eagles as we get ready to kick off this 2017 season is, of course, the always controversial and entertaining Marcus Hayes of the Philadelphia Daily News, who's kind enough to hop on board with us right now. Marcus, appreciate a few minutes. Always great to talk to you. Thanks for the time. And how are you? I'm great. I don't know if I'm always controversial and i'm not sure if i'm ever entertaining but i'll go with it <laughs> i'll tell you i'm like any writer in philadelphia and i have a few friends they'll read some stuff that you'll write and they'll text me you got to get marcus on you got to blast him I, I can't stand what he just wrote <laughs> anytime you write something there's always an opinion and there's always a reaction and sometimes and you see it on twitter people will be saying nice things about you and then people will be saying this guy marcus he has no clue what he's talking about yeah, I wish I, I wish I could find the nice things. I, uh, <laughs> you know, the other, but no, I get your point. But that's my job, right? My job is to get people talking. Yep, and you got people talking uh, earlier this week, yesterday. But before we get to that, let's get to what people are talking about today. And that's Fletcher Cox not showing up to the first OTA. I know it's not mandatory, but it's still not a good look to me. How do you break that down? Are you okay with Fletcher Cox not being there today? I, you know, I don't care if anybody doesn't go to anything as voluntary as a uh, – as a veteran, number one, this, especially when it's a, a current regime. Last year, when Sam Bradford wasn't there, when the offense was being installed, I had a much bigger problem, especially since he just signed a deal, not unlike Fletcher Cox, just signed a big deal. But there's nothing that Fletcher Cox is really going to do or learn this week, and I'm not sure that the team needs him there. It's a terrible look. It, it, it undercuts any sort of, you know, I guess uh, – premise that he's a leader on this team because if you're a leader you show up when it's work time and it also maybe creates the narrative and who knows maybe there's a personal reason why he's not there and if so then I'm okay with him missing it but it does create that narrative and fans will forget about it if he gets the first game of the season and has three sacks and is a monster like we expect him to be but it creates that narrative that Fletcher Cox right now doesn't care and uh, you're right I just don't think it's a good look right now and it creates that bad first impression and makes a story where really if he just showed up it wouldn't even have been a story well you know what if he'd had 10 sacks last season, it'd be a much a much less of a story You're than right. you know, having signed for you know a hundred million dollars or whatever it was. I mean, this is a guy who had who had a down year, who you know was not the player that they paid him to be, and for him not to be at OTA, whether or not they're mandatory, it's kind of a slap in the face to the regime, and not just the Peterson, Doug Peterson, uh, Jim Schwartz regime, but the Howie Roseman regime. You know, hey, you gave me a hundred million dollars, I'll be there when I get there. Marcus Hayes with us right now from the Philadelphia Daily News. The other day, you had a column, and the headline was Eagles GM Howie Roseman hasn't given Coach Doug Peterson enough weapons to win. Let me just give you my thoughts real quickly, because some stuff I agree with it, some stuff I disagree with it. I don't believe the Eagles are a playoff team. I could see the argument why they are a playoff team, but right now I have them penciled in at eight to nine wins, leaning more towards eight. Uh, let me just ask you, because you wrote in your article, you said probably seven wins, maybe eight. With the improvements that were made in the offseason, why can't this team at least make a one-win improvement automatically in the uh, mind of one Marcus Hayes? Because they're not they're the worst team in their division, for one thing. You have to win your division if you want to go to the playoffs. That usually takes 9 to 11 wins, probably 11, because I think the Cowboys, especially offensively, are going to be just as good or better this year compared with last. The Giants are a real good team. And, you know, you have to prove to me that the, the Redskins aren't better than the Eagles. So, all that said, you know, when you parse it, you can't say definitively this is an eight-win team. I mean, last year I wouldn't have said they were an eight-win team. Two years ago, I don't think I've ever—I don't think I've picked them to win more than ten games in like five, six years. You know, so to posit that this is a nine or ten-win team when you still don't have a cornerback that you can say is a you know a number one cornerback when you might not have a receiver who's a number one receiver, considering what Torrey Smith and Alshon Jeffrey have done recently. Uh, that to me is just a, you know, it's, it's a hopeful argument. You know, I, I don't hope the Eagles are, you know, I don't hope the Eagles win seven or eight games, but it's not my job to hope. It's my job to be realistic. 
And let's just go off the hopeful term, and let's just say, and I know this may not be realistic, but let's just say the defensive line is as good as advertised, the offensive line stays healthy, Alshon Jeffrey stays healthy, and you also have LeGarrette Blunt give you decent production. If everything goes right, what's your apex on this team this year? Maybe nine. Hey, you know, no no I, way I, to again, ten. I, I can't see – there's no way I can see – look at the receivers in this division, not in the league, just in the division versus the cornerbacks on this team. And, you know, you can max protect against the cornerbacks on this team and give those receivers all the time they need. And you've got three very good very good quarterbacks in this division right now and a lot of really good receivers. So you're operating – and the league, you know, the league is designed to maximize passing attacks. You have three passing attacks that are superior, above average, or, or, or good in this division – You've got one of the worst defensive back cores in the league as far as we can tell right now. So, you know, that's that's one issue. The other issue is I'm not sure that this offensive line is any better than it was last year. You're gonna have a second year player in Sam Alu if if they if they get what they want, you're gonna have Isaac Sam Alu starting at left guard, which I, I endorse. I think he has to start at the third round pick. But I don't know that he's gonna be better than you know, Stefan Wisniewski, Alan Barbary. I, I don't expect him to be better. It's his first year starting at left guard. You know, Jason Peters is a year older, and I believe his Pro Bowl, uh, his Pro Bowl accolade last year was undeserved. And I know Jason Kelsey's was. So you've got two units, from my perspective, that aren't a whole lot better. Just because you add a couple of wide receivers, that doesn't give you two more wins. I said it two weeks ago. I talked about the offensive line, and I do have some concern with the age mentioned and also uh, the play of Kelsey as well. So I do see that side of the argument. But in your article, as we're talking to Marcus Hayes, you said Peters disappeared last year after the Lane Johnson suspension. I don't think he was deserving of a Pro Bowl, but I thought that overall he did have a good year last year. How did Peters disappear last year? He didn't make any play. Well, there are two things Peters didn't do last year that make him worth $10 million a year. He didn't stone guys at the line of scrimmage. You, didn't, you don't have to give up sacks. You can give up hurries and pressures and force the, force the quarterback the other way. But he didn't stone guys at the line of scrimmage, which is what we're used to seeing him do. And he didn't do much at the second level as a blocker. Those are the two things that make him special. Those are the two things that make him Jason Peters. And he's done them in the past here, but post-injury, you know, post-Achilles injury. He just didn't do it. You know, he was, a, he was a non-factor in most of the games, most of the losses. You have to understand, when you're making that kind of money, you can't not be a factor. You can't disappear. You have to make big plays when you're played big money. And are you name me three big plays he made after Lane Johnson went, went away. He did not. He, have, he didn't have a great year. You're right on that, and you're right that he's not going to be someone that's going to be ten, eleven million dollars. But when you have the idea of just disappearing, it makes it as if you're saying he was not existent. And there was times last year where he did have good games. But I'll ask you this though: at his age, and I think you're right, he's not worth the ten, eleven million dollars anymore. And they're stuck with him now. They weren't going to do the renegotiating thing, uh, just judging by some of the comments that they made uh, before the season ended and even during the off season. With Peters, how does he have a good year this year? Like at this point, even though he's not going to be the player of a ten, eleven million dollars, how does he have a good season in your mind? Well, as long as he gets a little bit of help, which he is loath to take, and as long as he's kept fresh, the way they tried to keep him fresh last year without wearing him down very much. And again, I'm not denigrating Jason Peters. What I'm saying is the line didn't get better. We're talking about the team improving, and. If Jason Peters has the same sort of year this year as he had last year, then he, then the line's not going to get better. Marcus Hayes with us right now from the Philadelphia Daily News. So let's just say if they go seven and nine, how do they spin that as a successful season, Marcus? I don't think you. I, I, I don't think that you need to spin it as a successful season, as long as Carson Wentz improves. If Carson Wentz regresses, if Carson Wentz has has struggles and the offensive line plays well and the receivers play acceptably then Doug Peterson has an issue. And that was the crux of the article. The article wasn't the Eagles are going to win eight games or seven games and they're terrible. The argument was if they win six, seven, eight games, should Doug Peterson lose his job? My contention is no, because they are not appreciably better. They're not a 10-win team. They're probably not a nine-win team, especially playing in this division. So to answer your question, success equals 
development of Carson Wentz, you know, invisible development, real development. I think you're going to see that. I think they have a pretty good coaching staff in place to develop a young quarterback. Now let me just throw a curveball here at you as we're talking to Marcus Hayes because I do agree. I don't think Doug Peterson should lose his job this year, and the timetable I laid out was you give a coach three years, and uh, this team I still think they need another year before we could say without a doubt that they'll be a playoff team. But what happens if uh, in Baltimore – John Harbaugh, he misses the playoffs for the third straight year in a row. And let's say Baltimore uh, foolishly does fire one John Harbaugh and he becomes available. You know that there's going to be a push to get John Harbaugh to Philadelphia. So how 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 does Doug Peterson save his job if, let's say, they don't do better than the seven wins last year if Harbaugh becomes available? Uh, I don't know. I mean, (laughs) that is a curveball. You're, You're asking me to assume the firing of someone who has a job and seems to have pretty decent job security. I mean, if a guy like John Harbaugh comes available and Doug Peterson is doing a good job with Carson Wentz, I'm pretty sure you don't you don't jettison Doug Peterson for some somebody else, for a guy who just happens to be free because, you know, that doesn't show any sort of commitment to the program. And again, the most important person in the Eagles franchise since the drafting of Donovan McNabb is Carson Wentz. They weren't firing Andy Reid. You know, Andy Reid could have done pretty much anything and did a lot of stuff, did a lot of stuff badly, you know, and had some success, but also had some failures with Donovan. This is, these guys should be joined at the hip as long as Carson progresses. I don't, I don't care if, uh, you know, uh, Newt Rockney, Rockney comes back. This is your coach, <laughs> you know, this is your coach. This is the guy that wanted to draft Carson Wentz. And as long as Carson Wentz is progressing in your, in your opinion, in, in your view, if you're the Eagles front office and the Eagles management, and the Eagles owner, Jeffrey Lurie, then you stay with the guy who's progressing the quarterback. Because honestly, you know, being a head football coach, especially this day and age, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not splitting the atom. You know, there are, some, there are some pretty average people who have been successful with football, head football coaches. So, you know, and John Harbaugh has won one Super I love John Harbaugh. He's won one Super Bowl, and he's coached some pretty good teams, and he's developed a quarterback. He's a good candidate. But I don't know that you jettison your guy for some guy. With Doug Peterson, because you look at last year, he had some questionable play calling decisions. Uh, the decisions against the Giants to go for it wasn't the best play call. Then you had uh, the game against the Cowboys where he punts the football, could have taken a field goal. Uh, the two-yard challenge play against the Packers, we could go on and on and on. Uh, do you have confidence in Doug Peterson that he's going to have a better year from a coaching perspective this year, or do you think the jury's still out on Doug Peterson? Well, I'll put it to you this way. He's, he's connected to Andy Reid, you know, and Mike Holmgren to a degree. I believe that Doug Peterson probably made fewer errors in his rookie season than Andy Reid did, and he was a much less uh, attractive and much less experienced candidate. There's no reason for me to think that Doug Peterson can't learn. Of course, you know, for 12 years, 13 years, there was no reason for me to think Andy Reid couldn't learn, and he didn't learn much. I don't know if it's his DNA or if it's just the way things went, and it's amplified because of who he was with and that he was here. Maybe he'd have made these mistakes having never, you know, seen Andy Reid, having never experienced Andy Reid, and maybe Adam Gates was making the same mistakes down in Miami, I believe. We just, I don't know. What I do know is he's a pretty smart guy. He got a rookie one double A quarterback ready to start in ten days. Went three and zero with him, and did so with you know a, just a ton of pressure of being the guy that they settled for, of being the consolation prize. So yeah, I mean he did a great job early last year, and it, no one got on him as much as I did for his mistakes, his in game mistakes, and you know the defense of those in game mistakes in the moment. Nobody got on him as much as I did, and I'll continue to get on him because you don't get mulligans, you don't get do-overs in the NFL. You know, this is not a, this is not the process. This is the show. You, every game is a playoff game. You have 16 playoff games, and the postseason begins. So no, you don't get a, 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 you don't skate. You don't get a free ride. All that said, you gotta, you gotta assume guys are going to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. On the way out with Marcus Hayes, who joins us right now on the Zach Gelb Show. As you know, I'm a Patriot fan, and uh, I got to see LeGarrette Blunt play football for the last few years. And I, I think the 18 touchdowns are misleading. I think he's a good player, but there's a reason why he was still out there on the market. You asked it in your column, and what exactly is wrong with LeGarrette Blunt? 
How do you break it down that he was still on the market last year, uh, this year, and he lasted a lot longer than what people expected him to be on the market for? You know, Belichick is uh, he's a wonderful coach, but he's toxic. You know, he very rarely lets players go, as you know, who succeed other places, and he very often finds a guy who sort of fits the system or fits what, exactly what he wants and lets him blossom or allows him to blossom. I mean, Philadelphia knows that between Eugene Chung and Eric Rowe, two guys that were in <laughs> Super Bowl rings in the secondary, that the Eagles simply just let go over the last four or five years. So, I mean, uh, yeah, it's uh, – or Patrick Chung, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, I was going to say a, Eugene uh, for a second. I'm yeah, like, you Eugene meant Patrick. Chung's I, I knew what you were saying. Offensive, <laughs> <laughs> an assistant offensive line coach who does not play for Bill Belichick. <laughs> um, but, no, I mean, uh, that's uh, – you, you become toxic when Belichick – because he's already ever wrong. I don't know that – especially with, with the draft and free agency, there being so many running backs available in a very deep running backs draft that LeGarrette Blunt was in the right place at the right time. I don't know how much he has left. I, I would be surprised if he carries the ball 200, 220, assuming that no one else carries the ball hardly at all, 200, 220 times, gains 800 yards, and has 10 touchdowns in Philadelphia. But you know what that is? That's a steal if he does that. You know, that's, that's, a, that's the best-case scenario, I think. And even if he, you know, touches the ball eight times a game and scores five touchdowns, you know, that's a, it's a great deal for the Eagles. I saw him play today. I, I thought he was going to come out in a walker or something. He was, you know, for a one, two, five, I thought there had to be something structurally wrong with the guy. He looks fine. He took every first team snap. LeGarrette Blunt's the starting running back for $1.25 million, Philadelphia Eagles. Maybe Bill's wrong about this, or maybe, maybe there's something he knows. I don't. But, think, uh, I don't think he's wrong about it, he, and I think he could have a good year this year with the Eagles. I just knowing and seeing how Belichick negotiates this thing, there's really not a lot of room to negotiate with Bill Belichick. And just look out, he maybe perceives the running back position. You look at this run that New England's had that has won them five Super Bowls. They never, and I know running back, this is like how it is the whole league, but every one of those Super Bowl teams, there is a different core of running backs in there, and he just went somewhere else this year. That's what I think it comes down to. He said, here's a cheap price tag. If you don't want to match it, then we're going elsewhere. Yeah, and you know what? LeGarrette's probably looking at next year's contract, too, that if he signs cheap with New England, he's never going to escape that service. Yep. You know what I mean? In his mind, it's a cycle for him. So he's in a place here where, you know, he's the man. He's the lead dog. So, And Carson Wentz needs him desperately. I mean, he needs him to learn the offense and pass block and catch a few passes, you know. But uh, And I don't know how equipped LeGarrette is at doing any of those things at this juncture, but um, he, he needs him. He's very, very important to this team as of today. Marcus, we'll end you with this. Alshon Jeffrey, if he stays clean and if he could stay healthy, what type of numbers do you expect him to be to hopefully improve uh, that Birds offense that was uh, ranked 22nd last year in the National Football League? You know, quite frankly, I'm not a big, I'm not a big fan of Al Alshon Jeffrey. Why is that? I, not, I'm not a non. I just don't think he's a dynamic receiver at this point. I think he's a uh, sort of a system guy. I would be surprised if Alshon Jeffrey has as many catches for as many yards or, and as many touchdowns as either Jordan Matthews or Zach Ertz next year for a couple of reasons, mainly because Carson Wentz is more familiar with Zach Ertz and Jordan Matthews, and honestly, they might be better than him. They might be more potent than him. There's, you know, there's a reason nobody gave him big money. He took a $5 million pay cut to come play here. You know, you can pretend that the Minnesota Vikings offered him more total money, but I don't think they offered him more guaranteed money, and if they did, it was for a longer term. There's a reason he, Chicago didn't want him back and nobody else wanted him. And, and that, that again, reason has I think to he be makes health, the team right? better. What's that? That reason has to be health, why they didn't want to bring him back, I'm assuming, right? No, I, I think he wanted more money than he's worth. I mean, he got $9 million. I mean, you look at his numbers just from last year, I believe, and the fact that he was suspended. Is he worth $9 million to you? You know, I, 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 he's not to me. And this is not to necessarily denigrate Alshon Jeffrey. I'm, my point is, I'm not sure he's a number one receiver, and I'm certainly not sure he's going to catch, you know, 75 balls for, you know, 1,000 yards and nine touchdowns or something like that, which is probably what it's going to take to make him worthy of a franchise tag, which is everybody's pipe dream. Well, you know, he got franchised last year at 14 I think it's fourteen nine. He didn't play to fourteen nine. Marcus, we appreciate it as always. Thanks so much. All right, Zach. There's Marcus Hayes from the Philadelphia Daily News joining us on the Zach Gelb Show, Fox Sports nine twenty, the Jersey. A few things I'll say, 
And I happen to think that Marcus is right, that this is not a playoff team. Can I see the argument why they could be a playoff team? Yes. If everything goes right with this team, they could be a 10-win team. But I don't have the confidence to say everything's going right. Last year, they had seven wins. They made improvements. And with that alone, just off the improvements they made, I at least have to give them a one-game win improvement. So that's why I bump them up from seven to eight. I told you the other day, my win range for this team this year is anywhere from seven to ten wins. If everything goes wrong, they will revert back to last year and there will be seven wins. But if half the things go right, 60% of the things go right, they should make a one-game jump with the quarterback of Carson Wentz. And I like LeGarrette Blunt, and I think you need to surround LeGarrette Blunt with the right pieces, and I think they do have some of those right pieces. Yes, Sproles gets another year older. We'll see what you get out of Smallwood and Pumphrey. But this is an Eagles offense. I don't think they're going to be great this year, but I think they'll be a good offense with Wentz taking another step. And I disagree with them and Alshon Jeffrey. Alshon Jeffrey, if he could stay healthy, will be over a 1,000-yard receiver this year for the Philadelphia Eagles. This is someone that, in his career, has been a 1,300-yard receiver, a 1,400-yard wide receiver. He's a really good wide receiver. And why he didn't get the big deal this year? Just look at the market. Terrell Pryor didn't get a big deal either, and that's because a lot of people thought he's an unproven commodity. Alshon Jeffrey, we've seen the sample size, but with that being said, the last two years, he hasn't been able to stay healthy. And he put those numbers up in Chicago. Last time I checked, yeah, Jay Cullors, their quarterback, and there were injuries there. I'd still rather have Carson Wentz over any of those options in Chicago. I like the acquisition of Alshon Jeffrey. And I think when you pair him with Torrey Smith and you pair him with Jordan Matthews, and maybe you could get something out of Matt Collins and Gibson, then you have a pretty good wide receiving core. Not great. But it's much better than last year. And you also add in another running back that you give the ball to inside the red zone. That helps the quarterback out. And he's right. Everything is about helping out this quarterback. And this year is determined and evaluated on the success of Carson Wentz. But when you look at the coach, the coach to me is a big ambiguous point with this team. Yes, he went through a lot last year. Josh Huff, Nigel Bradham. Sam Bradford getting dealt and Wentz having to get him all caught up to speed. But there's a lot of times in the game where he wasn't good. And you could prepare your team all you want. You got to be good in the game. And you can't be in your number two making terrible decisions against the Cowboys. Terrible decisions against the Giants. You just can't be doing that. And I think the jury's still out. And I told you, this is going to be the storyline. If the Eagles don't make the playoffs, and I don't think this is fair, but if the Eagles don't make the playoffs, people are once again, if let's say they go eight wins or seven wins, they're going to continue to question the coach. They are. Especially if you have some games where he calls a bad play against the Cowboys or calls a bad play against the Giants. And I'm telling you, the storyline to watch, we even got some calls about this last year, if Harbaugh gets fired. And I think the world of John Harbaugh, I think he's a good coach. Very good coach. And Mark Eckel even said on the show before, if Harbaugh becomes available, get rid of Peterson. If Harbaugh becomes available, it's going to be tough to try to come up with an explanation, unless if the Eagles make the playoffs this year, to keep Doug Peterson. That's just my opinion on it. But overall, why won't this team make the playoffs? If I had to make that argument, and that's where I do believe they won't make the playoffs, I think he brings up a great point about the corners. The corners stink. And you could have a good defensive line all you want. That defensive line at times last year was inconsistent. And you still need to cover Odell, Brandon Marshall, Sterling Shepard, Des Bryant, Terrell Pryor, and that's going to be a problem. It is going to be a problem. And then finally, just the one point about Jason Peters, where he's asking me to name three plays on Jason Peters. I can't name three plays about any offensive lineman in the league. And I'm someone that played offensive line. And every week, my keys to the game, offensive line, defensive line, win the battle in the trenches, football cliche, football cliche, one-on-one here on the Zach Gelb Show. I don't want to hear from an offensive lineman. I don't. They're not the person that you look at and you say, oh, I can name you like three great 
catches last year. Well, no, but on the Eagles, but three great catches from Odell Beckham last year. I can't do that from an offensive lineman. Jason Peters last year, he did not stick out to a point where you said, wow, he's really bad. He had an okay year. He wasn't a pro ball caliber player, but he did make it. But that's the pro ball system right now. He was fine last year. But I do question, another year older, what is he going to do this year? Jason Kelsey. We know he struggles when he goes up against a bigger defensive lineman. What is he going to look like this year, another year older? Now you do get Lane Johnson back. Brooks is a good player. This offensive line, though, I'm not as high on it as other people are. But we appreciate Marcus Hayes for joining us from the Philadelphia Daily News. If you want to react to that, 609-919-9200. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll talk a little hockey. We'll get into some of the new celebration rules as you could finally. I just want to celebrate, baby, another day of living. You can finally celebrate again in the National Football League. And Roger Goodell, Mr. No Fun, is allowing his players to actually have some fun. Wow. The commissioner finally made a good decision. Shocking, I know. (laughs) You must be in your car right now and saying, did Zach just say that? Because I can't stand Roger Goodell. But he finally made a good decision today. And we'll also get into a little Sixers. Some possible trade innuendo, and also Daria Sarge. Should he be the rookie of the year? We'll get into all that next on the Zach Gelb Show. 441 is the time in the Princeton Orthopedic Associate Studios. We're coming on back right after this on Fox Sports 920 The Jersey.